And my talk is called Agaves of Northeastern Mexico. And uh, my definition for the purpose of this talk of Northeastern Mexico is the states of Coahuila, Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, and San Luis Potosí. So that's only four states out of, I think, 28 in, in Mexico. But what an amazing assortment of agaves are to be found there. Okay, uh, this is an agave that's not very well known, agave pocherana. Uh, I first got acquainted with it when it was on the ISI list back in, I think, the uh, late 70s or early 80s. And uh, so Ruth likes agaves, and she said, we've got to get one. You know, we have, don't have this one. So we got it, and it really doesn't uh, blow you away right away when you look at that plant. It's got stiff, sword-like uh, glaucous leaves. Uh, it's nice, but maybe nothing to write home about. But after growing for some years, uh, it eventually flowered. And now I think you'll appreciate this is a really special plant. So it grows in Coahuila and also in uh, neighboring Chihuahua. Uh, very cold tolerant. It can take it down to 20 with no trouble. I don't know how much colder. Uh, and it is in the subgenus Latea. If you know about the uh, subgenera of uh, agaves, subgenus Latea, like this, has a stalk with no branches on it. And here in the background, you see subgenus agave with those branches and the flowers at the end of branches. So uh, the Latea agaves are, are all over the place in Mexico, as well as the uh, agave agaves. Uh, but this one, uh, I just couldn't believe how packed together the flowers were, and pink is not a common color in agave. Uh, but it is interesting that the agaves do have pink flowers, seem to be concentrated in north central Mexico. Agave polyanthiflora, a little bitty thing with pink flowers. Uh, this one, and agave oruensis, which is a, a big Americana type one, has pink flowers also. So I can't imagine why that's true, but there you go. But in this case, the pink flowers with those brilliant red and yellow uh, stamens, uh, what a stunning effect. I was so excited when this bloomed, I called the newspaper and they sent a photographer out and made the front page of the garden section. <laughs> there it is in Habitat. This was actually taken in uh, Chihuahua uh, to the west of the area I'm covering in my talk, but I don't have a picture of it uh, in uh, Coahuila. But you can see, uh, like many of the plants, in, this is in the uh, section marginate of the agaves, uh, many of the plants in this group have this sort of an inflorescence that goes sideways after going up rather than going straight up. So you find this with lechuguilla and lofantha and other, other uh, plants in the same group. But this is a lot more spectacular than those. Okay, agave parasana. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, it's named after the town of Paras in southern Coahuila. And we had a plant for many years in the garden. We first got it just labeled agave species Coahuila. And uh, I thought it was the most wonderful thing, and I wanted to go see it in habitat. Eventually, I found the name was agave parasana. And so I went on a trip down there with a friend of mine uh, to try to find it in habitat. But this plant is not easy to get to. It doesn't grow near any paved road. It's way up in the mountains. And uh, after thrashing around at various localities where we knew it grew up in the mountains, we couldn't find a way to get up there. And we had to come back uh, without having seen it. Well, my friend along the way had seen another agave, agave flexispina, that he thought was really neat. So he got a couple of pups off that, wanted to bring them back across the border. And I said, well, maybe that's not the best idea. But he said, oh, yeah, we, I, we can do this. So, so he wrapped them up carefully and put them inside the middle of a big bag of granola. And I said, they won't find it there. And then after a while, I said, you know, that, that might not be good enough, you know. And so he said, OK. And he took it out of there. And I had got out of the car and stepped into a drainage <coughs> ditch and got my shoe all wet. And I didn't have a ready means to uh, do anything about that. So I just stuck it inside a bag and, and wrapped it up. And so I'll deal with that when I get back to the United States. Well, after a few days at 100 degrees out in the sun, that bag was getting a little rank. And so I said, well, let's take the uh, shoe out of the bag <coughs> and put those agaves in there in the toe of the shoe and then stuff the funky sock in after it. And, and uh, that should be a good place. So, 
we got to the border and we were crossing into Texas. Well, for those of you who don't come from the United States, you might not know that our states have different personalities. And, and Texas is not really known as a bastion of liberal-minded tolerance. And, and uh, <laughs> when, when they saw our California plates, and we'd been camping out in the desert, and uh, maybe it looked a little worse for wear. Let's just say I didn't look like I was ready for a reception with the queen. And they said, aha, you know, we're going to get these guys. And so they flagged us aside and uh, got the meanest woman on the, on the force to uh, go over us. She had the personality of a junkyard bulldog. And uh, she went over everything. She started pulling everything out. She opened the... Uh, the the last tray and make sure there was no joints in there and she had mirrors under the car and she had dogs in there sniffing everything and uh, couldn't find anything and, and uh, then she came to the bag of granola well she pulled that out and she got a little probe and she stuck it in there and ooh good thing we didn't do that and then she got to the bag and I'm going oh no and she opens the bag one whiff <laughs> and through we went so it worked out okay but anyway, back to agave parasana. Eventually, I did get to find agave parasana in habitat. These are two pictures of plants in cultivation. Uh, not all plants have that extreme degree of bud printing, but boy, isn't that spectacular. Uh, there it is in habitat. Uh, that's a pretty nice specimen for the teeth right there. And here you can see a plant coming into flower. Now, if you notice, Right in there, there's a big congestion of brats. This is a high altitude plant and it doesn't bloom all in one season, like most agaves. It starts in one year, goes up to a certain extent, and then has this little brat covered club that persists all, of, all through the wintertime. And then spring comes and it resumes growth, makes the branches and flowers. And uh, so it takes an entire year from the time the stalk starts until you have open flowers. So uh, that's kind of an unusual trait. Uh, but anyway, there it is uh, in bud uh, in the Sierra Patagalana in Southern Coahuila. Okay, well just uh, close up on the plants in cultivation. Uh, there you see the agave with that inflorescence coming up. So this is, it stays just like that all through the winter. So for months on end, it doesn't do a thing. Waiting for the spring. And there is a close up of it, uh, oops. In, in habitat, and you can see kind of the stretch marks on the, on the bracts. And uh, there's the uh, plant with open flowers. So this is at the Bancroft Garden. This was actually an exceptionally blue plant, one of the bluest that I ever saw. But those bright red buds and those brilliant yellow flowers, what a plant. And very compact. I mean, that fence is six feet high, so that whole plant only about 10 feet tall. Okay, Asperina. This is, uh, used to be called Agave Scabra. That's the name you'll find it under in Gentry's book. This is one of the most common plants uh, of all the agaves of northeastern Mexico over huge areas. A lot of agaves you only find on uh, mountain sides and on rocks, but this one's not proud. It uh, will grow right in the, in the plains in great numbers. Uh, I call it the uh, taco agave because uh, unlike other agaves, the leaves are oftentimes kind of folded together and sometimes even almost touching at the middle. Uh, but not all populations do that. Uh, here it is in full bloom in southern Coahuila and a close-up of the flowers. And there's just close-ups of the leaves and you can see how uh, folded together they are there and here almost touching each other. Uh, the reason I call it the taco shell agave. Okay, agave Havardiana. Uh, these pictures are actually taken in West Texas. Uh, it grows also across the border into Coahuila, but I have not photographed it there. Uh, this picture here is in the Chisos Mountains in uh, Big Bend National Park, and this picture here in the Davis Mountains uh, farther west. And you can see that uh, this plant obviously has a much more pointy leaf and that one a more uh, truncated leaf uh, looking a lot like perii that it's related to. A very cold tolerant plant, agave havardiana. They grow that in Germany and so forth. And uh, there it is in flower at the Bancroft Garden on the left and a close up of the flowers on the right. When these things come into flower, 
I want to get flower close-ups, and so I always set up a ladder next to it, and uh, sometimes I, the ladder I have is a very funky ladder. It's kind of uh, a little bit wobbly, but the reason I use that ladder is because I can tweak it this way and that between plants in order to set it while I photograph, but that could be a liability because uh, if I was to fall, well, I wouldn't land so nicely. Agave lechuguilla, uh, I had to put this in there. It's a common agave of northeastern Mexico, uh, but it's more of a nemesis than a goal to, to something to find when you're traveling around. Uh, it's a, a de very definitely a shin stabber, uh, but it grows in big colonies. And uh, one of its characteristics is, you can see here on the leaves, there's little black dashes on the back of the leaf. Uh, it's in the marginate, and as you go farther south, it starts to kind of blend into agave lofantha that it's closely related to. Uh, not a very spectacular flower, kind of uh, mint ice cream green on the outside, sometimes with a bit of a purple flush to it. Uh, but there you have it, agave lechugia. Okay, there's its relative lofantha, grows farther south, uh, and uh, has many forms. Uh, this form here is the one whose uh, variegated version is called quadricolor. Uh, it has a shinier leaf than most, uh, very nice prominent teeth. Uh, that's a more mundane form of Lofantha, but it's very widespread in northeastern Mexico. Uh, flowers, again you have this uh, pale green flower color, and uh, in this case the uh, Stamens have uh, some purple as well as the yellow pollen. In this case, they don't. That's just the variation from one clone to another. Uh, a relative is agave funkiana. Uh, this picture here was taken uh, near Ciudad Victoria. And uh, that is, lo oh, that's a hectia. That's a hectia, but that's agave lofantha there and funkiana there. They're closely related, but you can see in this picture they look decidedly different. However, if you were to go to another part of the range of agave lofantha, you would find lofantha looking a lot like that. So they're not as distinct as they appear in this picture. Uh, but Funkion is much less widely distributed than lofantha is. Okay, there's uh, pictures of Funkiana in flower and a close-up of the flowers. Well, we've seen uh, some pictures of agave ovatifolia. It is uh, one of the most spectacular agaves of northeastern Mexico and uh, not described all that long ago. Greg, what year did you describe this? 2002. 2002. So here it is only 13 years later. Uh, but it's making a big impact uh, on horticulture because it's such a spectacular plant. Uh, when you're down at the bottom of the Sierra Lampazos, it's a very scrubby, dry area, doesn't look very botanically interesting, but as you go up the mountain, uh, it gets wetter and wetter, and you start seeing uh, echeverias, and you start seeing uh, epithalanthas, and all kinds of things. Uh, you have salvias growing with epithalanthas up on there, just uh, unlikely combinations. Uh, and up on the top, these things are all over the place, just thousands of agave ovatifolia. And they're interesting plants. They're big plants like this, invariably single in habitat, although sometimes they do pop in cultivation, and just sculptural wonders, they're wider than they are high. And this is one uh, that Greg Starr is particularly enamored of. He calls it El Rey, the king, and it has these amazing mammalate margins, uh, just a, a jewel of a plant. Oops. But uh, some of the plants are uh, not like that at all. This one doesn't have any mammalate margins on it, uh, but a very rose-like form. And there is one starting to come into bloom. And some of the plants have this feature, we call it a voleculate leaf, where there's little uh, ridges or furrows that run down. This one has only one on each leaf. This one has multiple ones. 
But that's a spectacular feature. But the majority of the plants don't have this. You can't buy a little plant and assume it's going to grow up and do this. That's only a minority of them. I don't know at what age it really starts to do this because uh, when I've grown them from seed, the whole batch don't look like this after several years. Uh, anybody grown this and, and could say at what age? Kelly? When they get big. When they get big, okay. <laughs> But anyway, it's a nice feature when, when you get it. And there it is uh, in flower. Uh, that's at Tim Gregory's house in uh, Woodside, California. And a close-up of the flowers. Okay, when I was up there looking at the plants, I found a natural hybrid, uh, Ovetifolia and Lechugia. So Lechugia is a widespread species, as I mentioned, and uh, it's very promiscuous. It does cross with quite a number of other species, uh, but this is the first time I'd known that it crossed with Ovetifolia. Actually, it's a rather undistinguished plant. Who wouldn't rather have the Ovetifolia? Okay, related to uh, Agave uh, Montana is Agave Gentrii. Uh, in Gentry's book, this is treated as agave macroculmus. But the problem with that name is that the type specimen had a combination of agave gentrii and agave montana mixed together. So that made the name invalid. So they uh, renamed this, this one as, uh, as gentrii. That's the lower altitude, greener one. And uh, the more compact, higher altitude one is montana. But they do mix together. Uh, you start out seeing these, and you see them both together, and then you get higher, and you get to pure Montana. Uh, but this is a big, robust plant. Uh, ours at the Bancroft Garden was about uh, five and a half feet tall when it flowered, and uh, a, a really big presence in the garden. Uh, it had more spirally leaves, uh, which you don't see in this specimen here. But notice the difference between this and this. This is on uh, Cerro Potosí, south of Galeana, in Nuevo León. And this one here, uh, farther north to the west of Monterrey. Uh, and here the plants are chunkier, shorter leafed. But again, you see these amazing inflorescences. People make fun of me when I breed agaves for the flowers. They say, oh, well, you know, it's going to be decades before it flowers. But when they do, what an event, you know? I mean, uh, why wouldn't you want to take that into consideration? But anyway, these ones come up with these big club-like uh, things, and then the flowers pop out from the club, uh, great big bracts. And uh, the branches, in this case, don't reach very far out. So it uh, has a very peculiar effect. And uh, you'll see this again with uh, Agave Montana. Uh, there is Gentrii in flower on the left, and a close-up of the flowers on the right. Okay, Montana. This is uh, another one of those iconic plants that uh, everybody ought to, ought to grow who can grow it, because it's, it's so beautiful. So uh, there it is uh, on the left uh, with a plant that's flowered next to... Uh, uh, another one that has not. And on the right, you can see the beautiful bluish uh, bud printing. Not all plants have this. Uh, some, even on the same mountain, some areas you'll come to with lots of plants that have this bud printing and other ones that don't. Uh, but it's really spectacular when it, when it exists. Uh, high altitude and very cold hearted. And when they bloom, uh, they can turn the most fantastic uh, fiery colors. So uh, there's a couple of examples. The one on the left is more red and the one on the right more orangey, but they could be yellow as well. And there's one in full bloom north of La Pena, and uh, you can see the plant has turned red and that fantastic congestion of huge bracts and those little short stubby branches and those beautiful flowers. What a plant. Well, I was lucky enough on one of my trips up there to find a monstrose plant. You don't find that very much with agaves. Now, I'm not going to claim that's the most beautiful agave in the world, but it sure is unique. 
Uh, we were at the same place on our uh, pre-convention tour uh, this year, and I looked to see if that was still there, but 10 years later, it was not. So, And then variegated. Who could complain about that? That was at the same site, and uh, what beautiful variegation. Uh, I didn't find this, uh, this one again. It was farther afield, and we, we didn't get over there. But anyway, uh, that's... A, an outstanding example of you know strong variegation. The the white's really white and the and the uh, green's really green and, and it really shows up nicely. And that's the sort of thing that Kelly would uh, take and run with if he got a hold of one. Okay, agave mitis. Uh, this one is uh, very common agave all through eastern Mexico. Uh, it actually can grow, as you can see here, in, in, as an understory in, in a, a forested area, not necessarily in the open. Uh, it does grow usually on rocks or cliffs, and it has various color forms. So uh, the green form is, is the most common, but there are quite a number of glaucous ones too. The really glaucous ones got the name of agave mitis variety albidior or celsii variety albicans, going with the old name. Uh, but really, there's lots of places where you see glaucous ones and green ones growing together, and I don't think that would really stand as a separate variety. But anyway, they're attractive. Uh, they have uh, an inflorescence that uh, is not very tall, and usually the face of the flower is purple, but not always. Uh, so here is an example of a, a nice purpley one, and this one only a bit of purple at the tip of the flower, and then more a pale yellow on the inside. Uh, but people made fun of me for growing agaves for flowering. This is a good example of an agave that you can grow for its flowers, because when it first starts out as one rosette, you have to wait years and years until finally it gets big enough to flower. But once it does, it starts clumping. And the clump gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And at this point, after 30-some years at the Bancroft Garden, our clump has 50 heads, and we get about a dozen heads bloom every year. So it makes a, a good show every year. And it's in about uh, May when they're in full bloom and uh, very attractive. Okay, there's the uh, pale form, variety albidior, and uh, there is showing a, a particularly, whoops, a particularly uh, nice clone called Chocolate Edge that has these dark brown margins setting off the green of the leaf, and uh, there's the flowers there. Okay, well, you couldn't talk about agaves of Northeast Mexico and not mention Agave Victoria Regine, an iconic plant, uh, a beautiful plant, a plant you could never see enough of. Uh, there it is in habitat in Huasteca Canyon, growing on limestone. So Huasteca Canyon is right near Monterrey, uh, just a 10-minute drive uh, into the uh, mountains from Monterrey. And yet it's like entering another world when you go there. There's these amazing rock formations, uh, fantastic plants, agave, Victoria originated. Some people have said this plant has been all collected out or it's a, now endangered or whatever, but that's ridiculous. You go to Huasteca Canyon, you see them by the tens of thousands all over the cliffs in a place where nobody could ever get to without uh, some serious rope and, and uh, climbing gear. Uh, they might be a little bit scarce down at the bottom of the cliff where they're easy to get at, but there's untold numbers of them. And uh, the markings on them vary quite a bit. You can see these ones are not as well marked as this one, but uh, just stunning plants. And just to show some of the variation in Agave Victoria Regine, sometimes the white markings are like dashes instead of a continuous line. Sometimes there's very few white lines at all, and sometimes they're really heavy. Sometimes people will tell you that a distinguishing feature between Agave Victoria Regine and Agave Nicholsiae, or Ferdinand I. Regis, is that Ferdinand I. Regis, or Nicholsiae, has multiple tips, and uh, Victoria Regine does not, but that isn't true. There's uh, sometimes multiple tips on Victoria Regine also. That is a spectacular plant. That's at Jeff Chemnick's house. Uh, and how could you get a, a neater and more beautiful agave than that? 
Okay, uh, what do these plants do under uh, stress in the dry season? Well, they kind of close up a little bit, and this one here turned more of a yellowish color, and this one turned more of a purplish color. That's both Victoria Regina. Well, you couldn't do better than that for a variegated plant. That's awesome. That was at, uh, at uh, Hans Bridge, and uh, I was just floored when I saw that. Okay, uh, there was an article that came out, I've forgotten what magazine, uh, uh, in a Mexican publication, in which they redid the Victoria Regina complex. So we had... Uh, Nicholsier or Ferdinand I. Regis originally as a separate species, then it got lumped into Victoria Regine, and in this article they took it back out. And, uh, and they also made this subspecies Swobode for smaller forms of Victoria Regine found to the west of Huasteca Canyon. Well, I don't know that I accept that as a subspecies. But anyway, they're interesting plants. There's one with the flower stalk coming up, and there's a close-up showing the plant. But I don't see enough differences here to make a separate subspecies out of it. But just suffice to say that uh, Victoria Regina does go westward into Coahuila, as well as the Nuevo Leon population. Nicholsier. Okay, this was long called Agave Ferdinandi Regis. But Nicholsier is the older name and uh, has priority. And uh, so the question is, is this really just a form of Victoria Regina, or is it a separate species? It's much, much rarer in nature than Victoria Regina. There's only a couple of hills that have these on them. And uh, they are a little bit bluer shade uh, than uh, Victoria Regina, have perhaps a little bit fewer leaves in a rosette, and uh, the leaves are usually a little bit more elongated, but they are kind of a variation on that theme. Uh, but I would like to uh, try to show you some differences between the two. So there's pictures of the, of the tips of the leaf of Nicholsier, and you can see that multiple, here's one, two, three, four teeth on the end of that one, three teeth on the end of that. They often do that, but not always. And as I said, Victoria Regina can do that too. Well, one thing I discovered when uh, Nicosier came into bloom, I got the ladder out and went up there to take a picture, and I noticed that the tips of the tepals had a little bit of fuzz on them. So there's a close-up picture. And that's not recorded in the literature. I, uh, in no book that I've seen have they mentioned that. And since I discovered this, I found that it's on a number of other agave species, too, that they have, you know, like sort of like a bearded iris, a little beard there at the end of the, of the tepal tip. So I thought that's kind of interesting. Okay, Nicholsier occurs along with three other agaves. Uh, Asperima is one, Lechigia is the second, and Striata is the third. It does not cross with Striata. I've never seen uh, Striata actually cross with anything in nature, uh, but it does cross with Asperima and with Lechigia. Uh, Asperima is the one that's been uh, uh, propagated more, and you see in cultivation, usually under the name sharkskin or sharkskin shoes, uh, and that's what that cross is. It's a very nice sculptural plant, but it does not have the white lines like the Victoria Regina parent or the Nicholsier parent has. Okay, so Victoria Regina versus Nicholsier. So here we have Victoria Regina and the inflorescence, and here we have Nicholsier and the inflorescence. Well, that inflorescence is twice as tall as that and considerably bigger around. So uh, that's the first difference. Uh, in order to take a flower picture of this, you would need a very tall ladder because there's the first flower. This one, you could do it just standing next to it. Okay, the flowers. Uh, the flowers of uh, Victoria Regina are here. They're whiter and Nicholsier, more purplish tinged. The flowers of this are much larger. There's the, uh, the ovary part, uh, green, and then the uh, purple tepals. Uh, much longer flower and not as densely packed together as the Victoria Regina. Okay, the fruits. The fruits are completely different. Uh, there's the fruits of uh, Victoria Regina. They look like 
uh, little black footballs, uh, American footballs that is, for those of you who are used to other kinds of things being called footballs. And these ones are tan and club shaped. So instantly recognizable from one seed pod, the difference. Uh, Huasteca Canyon, spectacular place. That's not the best picture in the world. You saw better pictures of Huasteca in some of the other presentations. But what a spectacular place. Well worth a visit. It's just a, a few minutes drive from Monterrey. And uh, there is agave bracteosa growing together with uh, Victoria Regine. They both grow in Huasteca Canyon. Usually uh, bracteosa is in more shady places and uh, Victoria Regina in more sunny places, but as you see in the picture, you can find them growing right together. Bracteosa is a very unique agave because it has no teeth whatsoever. Uh, the leaves are soft and pliable, so it's a more child-friendly uh, kind of agave. Uh, most people looking at it don't think it is an agave. It doesn't scream agave to you when you see it, but uh, it's a, a marvelous landscape plant. And when it's in flower, it's truly amazing. So it's a bottle brush type of inflorescence. Uh, so there it is at the Bancroft Garden with the flower stalk. And uh, there's thousands and thousands of flowers all packed together. Just an amazing thing. Okay, well, we've seen plenty of this. Agave Albo Pilosa. Uh, very restricted uh, range, but what a unique plant. Now it has those narrow leaves that suggest an affinity with the agave striata, which does grow near there. Uh, so some people have suggested it might be a natural hybrid of striata, but what would you cross with striata to get that? I don't know. Uh, it's it's uh, just a one-off, I think. Okay, it's uh, not often that you see a plant in flower. Uh, I've never seen a plant with open flowers, uh, but there is the inflorescence, and you see it nosedives at the tip. So there it is with hectias on the cliff face and the flower coming out. Uh, the part with the flowers there is uh, less than a foot long, so it's a, a pretty compact little inflorescence. And uh, clearly the plants don't bloom very often, because here you see an old inflorescence, uh, but looking up on the cliff, you see very few plants with any sign of an old inflorescence, and you're hard-pressed to find uh, a plant in flower. Uh, happily, somebody has found one in flower because uh, there are some seeds that were made available through rare palm seed, so some people are growing this now, and uh, what a nice thing, and I think it's been tissue cultured as well. Okay, this is agave Athenis ovatifolia. So uh, if you go west from Huasteca Canyon, get past all the Victoria Regines and, and so forth, and keep going up into the mountains, you come to this thing. And it seems to be related to uh, ovatifolia, but it's a little bit more perii-like. Uh, there are nice, robust plants, maybe that big around, and uh, very neat rosettes. Uh, this one here had the most extreme teeth of anyone that I saw, uh, but great plants, and I would love to have this thing find its way into cultivation. And a couple more pictures. There's one with the flower stalk starting up. It clearly doesn't have those great big thick bracts like, uh, like uh, Parasana does. But it's pretty cold up here in these mountains. I think this would take it down at least to the low 20s. Okay, agave Weberi, uh, another well-known agave from uh, northeast Mexico, uh, common in uh, the southern part of Texas as well as across the border in Mexico. It doesn't really have wild populations. This is one of those agaves that's been in cultivation for centuries and nobody really knows exactly where it comes from, but it's common plant as a field divider and so forth. Just like agave americana, a lot of these large agaves have a long history in cultivation, being grown for field dividers, being grown for uh, fiber and so forth, but nobody really knows where exactly they come from in the wild. Uh, but the variegated form is quite nice. Uh, so it looks pretty much uh, spineless here, uh, you know, there's no teeth on the edge, but there are often uh, very small teeth. 
And there is uh, agave weberi in flower at the Ruth Bancroft Garden and a close-up of the flowers. And sometimes they turn the most wonderful colors uh, when they bloom. A lot of agaves do this. We saw this with Montana a little bit ago. Uh, but a lot of agaves, the uh, green drains out of the leaf as it goes into flower and you get these wonderful colors that come out. So there is the stalk of Weberi with a nice red color and that is the leaves of a, a rosette that's dying. Not bad for color. Agave striata. This is another very common agave in northeast Mexico. Uh, narrow needle-like leaves. Uh, it's very variable. Both the uh, rosettes and the flowers uh, come in a wide variety of colors. Uh, here's a green one. And uh, the flower stalk's not very tall, quite slender, and maybe six to eight feet tall, not very tall. And uh, there's the purple form. So you can see this isn't a population that's all purple because there's green ones right there but they can turn the most wonderful purple or pink uh, color. And there's one that's more bluish on the left and a uh, very purple one on the right. So when you buy them in a nursery, uh, they're almost always on the green side. Uh, and even if you collect seed off a purple one, it usually doesn't come out so purple. You have to have really strong white uh, conditions in order to get that color, and you're lucky if you can get it at all. Okay, just to show the variability of agave striata, uh, we have one with uh, flowers as green as Ireland on the left, uh, one that's very purple on the right, and then in the middle we have a couple of other variants. Uh, this one's greenish but with a little flush of purple in it. This one's got more purple in it. But notice how much more congested that is than that. And those are, are quite congested. So the flowers are very variable. And even in the same population you have different colors. Agave striata subspecies falcata. This is the larger wire leafed version of agave striata. Uh, comes from Coahuila. And there it is uh, in cultivation. And there it is in flower. So the uh, plants are bigger, the flower stalk is taller, uh, and in this case, very green flowers. Agave Garcia Mendoza. This is a relatively recently described agave. It's in the Marginate, along with Lofantha and, and all the others. Uh, and it is, in, in nature at least, a resolutely single plant. Uh, it doesn't cluster like Lophantha does or like uh, Lechugia does. Uh, the leaves, actually it looks a lot like the uh, quadricolor form of Agave Lophantha, but bigger, uh, has those shiny green leaves and oftentimes a uh, pale yellow-green midstripe to it. A very handsome plant. And uh, there it is in flower, in habitat, uh, near uh, Guadalcazar, San Luis Potosí. And the uh, inflorescence there, that was taken at Kelly Griffin's house. Okay, agave americana. That's one of our most common agaves in the world. You see this all over the place. Uh, but the regular form of americana, the, the big form that we see planted everywhere, uh, is one of those cultigens. It's been in cultivation forever, but you don't find wild stands of that. But this shorter dwarfer form uh, does occur in northeast Mexico uh, near uh, Ciudad Victoria, and it's a, a very attractive plant. So here's a couple of examples, a bluer one and a, a more pale whitish one. This one has the better teeth, uh, but this, these are plants growing in the wild. And there it is in flower. And uh, there are kilometer 151 if you want to go see it. And, uh, and here you can see how red the buds are. Uh, unfortunately, it was an overcast day, so that's not the greatest picture, but you get the idea. Okay, Agave Zelanacantha. This is another one that's related to uh, Lofantha and Lechugia, 
but farther south. So just as Lechuguilla kind of fades into Lofantha, as you go farther south, Lofantha kind of fades into Xylonacantha. But with Xylonacantha, you have these most amazing, extreme teeth on it. Uh, very, uh, you know, intricate, uh, dissected margin to the leaf. That's more true in the southern populations than it is in the northern populations. It's extreme down in Hidalgo. Uh, but these are uh, forms from uh, San Luis Potosí and uh, Tamaulipas that are, uh, the leaves are not as long and the teeth are not as extreme. Uh, there it is in flower at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. And as I said, sometimes these plants in the marginate don't go straight up. They kind of wander off to the side. And the same pale green kind of flowers like you see with Lofantha and with Lechugia. Salmiana. This is another very common agave in cultivation. And it was the uh, main agave the Aztecs used to make pulque with. Uh, also very good fibers and much used for, for fiber as well. Uh, and it's very widespread in Mexico because it's been spread all over the place. Uh, but comes from eastern Mexico somewhere and uh, variety Salmiana maybe is harder to pin down, but variety Crassispina we, uh, we see in, in uh, northeast Mexico. There is Salmiana Salmiana. Uh, in flower, and a close-up of the flowers. And there's Crassispina. It's not quite as big, but that same deep green color. And that's uh, probably Franzacini behind. It's at the Bancroft Garden. And there's Crassispina. Again, these are, are, are not Salmiana here. Those are Franzacini. That's the Salmiana there and there. And the inflorescence is coming up. And uh, there are the flowers. This one is, is one that blooms a lot for us. And one of the things that I like about it is that after the main plant blooms, then you get little secondary inflorescences from the pups coming into bloom too. And so you get repeat bloom oftentimes several times over the course of the year. And the docents love it because you can't really examine those flowers closely without a big ladder. But the secondary inflorescences are right there at eye level where you can see them. Okay, well, there's a wonderful form of agave salmiana, which uh, I call Rumpelstiltskin because I like this uh, wrinkly uh, leaf surface. And this comes from uh, San Diego Botanic Garden, uh, or formerly Quail Garden. And uh, so they were nice enough to give me a pup. And so I planted that, and years went by, and it just looked like a regular salmiana. And I thought, ooh, that character didn't hold true, but now it really is coming out as it gets bigger. What an amazing thing. End of slideshow. <laughs>